We have Will Dobson, who is the Politics and Foreign Affairs Editor of Slate. Uh, previously, Will has been Editor of Foreign Affairs, Newsweek International, foreign, and Foreign Policy. And while he was there at Foreign Policy, the magazine twice won top honors in the National Magazine Award for General Excellence. That's quite an accomplishment, Will. Um, Will travel the equivalent of almost four times surfing the globe, um, almost 100,000 <coughs> miles within two years, to gather material for his book, which included interviews with over 200 people. Uh, during this time, his research was supported by such institutions as the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hoover Institution at Stanford. Uh, during the Arab Spring, Fred Hyatt of the Washington Post called upon Will to provide daily analysis of the events in the Middle East and when there were significant fractures in the learning curve for the world's dictators, the Washington Post outlet section commissioned him to, to provide the background and context. I figured that there's one more chapter, Will, in mm -hmm. the dictator's learning curve since your book was published. Published, and that is that um, I think that we've learned that uh, dictators with uh, sentences of life imprisonment uh, will be kept on life support by their uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, The New York Times called the learning curve for dictators intelligent and absorbing, and Publishers Weekly describes it as deft and incisive. Uh, it's not easy being a dictator today, as well as <laughs> um, In today's modern world, dictators have to adapt to more cunning strategies than simply murdering their enemies or sending them to the gulag. Uh, if every citizen with access to the internet or an iPhone can become uh, an investigative reporter. And Will Dobson is here to tell us all the trouble that dictators can get into with those and that's surrounded by those investigative reporters. Mm -hmm. So Will, come tell us about your book. Mm -hmm. So close to what is really, I mean, this, I mean, this place is tantamount to a national landmark uh, <laughs> to the reading public, um, and so it's, you know, you, I, I, I'll be honest. You have to say that when you are trying to write a book and you're living in this town, in the back of your head, when you're having a really bad day writing, you're thinking to yourself, but maybe they'll let me talk about it at politics. <laughs> and so. Thank you for, for you yeah. you talk about it. <laughs> well, one author's dream fulfilled today, so thank it's you very much. We let you, it's that we <laughs> you. I will give a, a, a sort of a brief overview, maybe try and keep it to 20 minutes on sort of the thrust of the book, um, and then more importantly, leave time for all of you to ask me any questions, and we can explore what what parts you find interesting. Um, well, Barbara's already said it, and it's exactly the case, is that it's not easy being a dictator today. Um, not long ago, an autocrat uh, could use the bluntest weapons in order to keep people <coughs> under his thumb. I mean, we sort of think of the Stalins, the Maos, the Pol Pots, um, the Gulag, uh, mass revolutionary campaigns uh, during the Cultural Revolution, killing fields. Um, but today's dictators uh, have far more forces arrayed against them uh, than any of those men had. Um, first, you know, they lost their chief, for many of them, they lost their chief sponsor uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union. In these intervening years since 1991, the democracy promotion um, business, if you will, has become an incredibly productive one. It's a cottage industry in its own right. Um, election monitors, human rights organizations, they all stand at the ready to shine a spotlight. I mean, one of the sort of 
powerful examples in my mind of this is, is to take a seminal event like Tiananmen Square in 1989. When the Chinese Communist Party wanted to declare martial law, just before they did, what did they do? They literally pulled the plug on CNN. That would be impossible now. Uh, if people were to mass in Tiananmen Square today, it would be captured on an iPhone. Take, for example, the sort of perfect parallel, perhaps, of what's happening in, this, in Syria right now. Um, in 1982, Bashar Assad's father brutally crushed an uprising in Hama. More than 25,000 people killed in the space of a month. Crusaders came with those big heavy swords, and the Saracens came back with those thin little swords that could cut through anything, but they were so sharp. Um, my question is, um, Syria. Applying this sort of model to Syria, Assad is, is doing what his father did. Um, it's much more visible now, and he hasn't, he hasn't sort of killed them in rows like we think his father did. He kills them in groups. <laughs> um, I mean, it's not, they, they just don't mow right through right. a city like, like they supposedly do in Hama. But using your model, what do you think will happen? Is there any way that uh, the rebels can pull it out? Or are we just going to see, you know, an awful civil war like Lebanon? Uh, well, I mean, I think the, the, the danger of civil war is an obvious one now. I mean, I think this is a distinct possibility, and unfortunately, those outside of this conflict aren't helping matters by infusing it with arms, and that's not just that's not just the Saudi Arabia and, and other states in the region, but that's NATO, and Russia, and, and perhaps even ultimately the United States. Um, I, I don't think that Assad's regime will ever be the same. That's much we can say now. I, it, I think it's impossible to say whether or not we're talking about a year or ten years or five, but. The regime has lost its legitimacy in a way that I don't think it can regain it. Uh, I think that he's, he's making the newest textbook case of what not to do. Uh, because his response, you know, at this point, he's sort of, it's, it's, it's too far. He's too far in to change course. Um, his mistakes, you know, they go back again to sort of allowing something like this to gather steam the way he did. I mean, if you go back to last March um, of 2011, his, almost his initial reaction was violence. Uh, there were promises of addresses and a major address to the people. Um, this was the moment when other regimes found ways to come up with accommodations that would sop up dissent but not actually lead to any genuine change, what we see in a Jordan or a Morocco uh, or a Malaysia, where they actually began to talk about reform constantly and then about eight months later put forward the legislation which tightened the regime's control over protesters. Um, what Assad did was come out and say, I'm going to give a major address about, the, about, about all of this that's going on in the country. And they came out and said, OK, everyone that's rebelling is a drug addict. Not a particularly sophisticated message. I mean, he, 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 he saw to it that, that he was not going to try to persuade people, but he was just going to try to cow them. And then that then was followed by massive violence. What we have, when you, sort of, when you look at these situations, I think what you have to think about is you have to say, okay, there's a minority in the country that sees its future tied to Assad. They don't believe that they have a promising future unless Assad continues. And whether they like his method or not, they've hitched themselves to it. And then you have another group of people that are committed in their, in their opposition to the regime. When we add up those two sides, we're still left with about 90% of the country, which is in the, in the middle. And that's what, this, that's what these struggles are about, is trying to pull them one way or the other. What's very encouraging right now is to see something like we saw two days ago, where you have someone, a fighter pilot, def defecting. Um, that's really where the most good can be applied, is convincing people that are in, that, in his camp that you actually that you have a future in this Syria that's going to come. Um, you know, the most sophisticated opposition uh, struggles understand that they need the police and the support of the police and the army. And you don't actually need them to come over to your side. You just need them to become indifferent. You need them not, not to show up at work tomorrow. There's nothing more effective than having 
those police and generals come out, and when they look into the crowd, they see their children, or the friends of their children, or what have you. That tells them, wait a minute, what am I doing here? That's, it's a good question. I don't really take up the sort of the private sector actor in this equation. And certainly in some states, it's an enormously important one. I mean, you know, not you don't have to necessarily think about China, but you can even think about uh, I'm thinking of a more fragile state, um, you know, like oil companies in Equatorial Guinea or something like that. I don't think that the private actor really cares about the politics one way or the other. They are able to make a deal and arrangement with any regime that comes in, whether it be democratic or or authoritarian. So I think that they, in some ways, they may be the most rational actor. They're just purely pursuing their interests to all end, and to some degree, damn the consequences. Uh, because what we offer will probably be attractive to either side. I mean, it's the rare example that you see a state like um, East Timor, that was a, a young democracy. Um, that actually, you know, it had, it was a kind of incredible instance where they learned, you know, they were, they were a young democracy and then they learned that they had access to these um, oil, to these shoals that had tremendous oil um, off the coast. And so immediately you had uh, you know, every oil company in the world lining up to say, let me be the one to help you access that. And mm -hmm. they actually said, no, we need to slow down because we haven't had the chance because we've only been at this for a few months. We haven't actually had the chance to even set up an institution that could take in what is going to be a windfall of cash. And we know if we do that, we'll just become another corrupt, oil-cursed country. So we hear you. We've got your names. We've got your business cards. We'll get back to you once we've got enough infrastructure that we can actually believe we can handle the money. I don't know that that's actually ever happened in any other moment in world history. Um, so you know, I think it's sort of telling that at least you know, the, the the private sector equation in this kind of cuts both ways, but I don't think it's determinative of one outcome or another. I really started out um, with this project. That was really sort of the um, that was sort of the example that I think was on everyone's mind in 2009. Um, you know, this wasn't you know we now sort of the green the green movement is sort of receded in our memory because it's been overtaken by these images of the Arab Spring. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I have to, you know, well, and a lot of my thinking on this is really, um, I have to credit Sergio, and I have to credit um, a friend of mine, Kareem Sajapur, at the Carnegie Endowment. I mean, one of the things that I, you know, I, I think personally that Iran sort of figures into both of these. In some ways, Iran was much more uh, the sophisticated regime before a lot of these others were. But when faced with this crisis in 2009, it responded brutally. Um, part of what the problem is in a country like that is that the opposition was very effective in dealing with it. Um, they made a lot of very predictable mistakes uh, by beginning to, uh, for example, to get specific. You know, we were overwhelmed in June 2009 when we saw the vast number of people that came out to the streets. And they came out, and that was an amazing show of force. But having done that, they then they just stayed there. And they just became a target. Uh, at any, the moment in which your, your movement becomes predictable, and is no longer keeping the regime guessing of what's going to have, happen next, it's about to get bloody. Um, it would have been much more effective if they had receded. Because, I mean, that's just a terrifying thought from the point of view of the regime, is that you were all here, and then you left. Now where are you? What mischief are you causing now when you spring up, in the, in the, not in Tehran, but the 10 next largest cities? Um, they, they ended up taking what was a very costly approach. And so I think they ultimately made it too easy on the regime to crack down. It's still a ripe situation because there is, it is a government that has a lot of division within it. And that's also part of the problem of the, of, the, of the squash revolution, if you will, of 2009, which is that it was also being led by people who were really part of an old order that didn't really want to seek change. So it was a compromised agenda from the very beginning.